Welcome back to our office. Today it's beautiful springtime in Oregon, which means it's sunny out and it means I have terrible hay fever. So please excuse my nose and my interruptions if I have to uh, <clears throat> clear myself. So we have a nice topic today. It's called simulating matter with molecular dynamics. So we're talking about molecular dynamics. And you know, recently I warned you when we did Feynman path integration that it was a hard topic. Here, this is an easy topic. Conceptually, most of the students say, hey, this is just what I thought computational physics should be. It's just, you know, you just compute everything and, so you, and you reproduce nature. Well, that's right. Okay? So it's a very straightforward, it's obvious, and it's ridiculously effective. Okay? So let's talk about molecular dynamics and what it is. Okay. So what can you do with molecular dynamics? Here's our problem. Will a collection of argon molecules form a liquid and then an ordered solid as the temperature is lowered? That's your problem. The answer is yes. Okay? And we'll show you exactly how that, that happens. Okay? What, so what we have here, actually, on this slide is a little image, a little visualization of ordered structure that argon forms. Interesting. And uh, that's what you should get as you lower the temperature enough if you keep a bunch of argon atoms together. Very interesting. OK. So recall your introductory chemistry class, if you ever took chemistry, if you can even go back that far, and your study of an ideal gas. And one of the things we did in introductory chemistry, at least when I took it, is we derived the ideal gas law. We derived PV equals nRT. Okay, where P is the pressure, V is the volume, N is, I don't know, the number of moles, R is some constant, and T is the temperature. But what's interesting is we derive this just as billiard balls bouncing off the walls of a container of the box. So there was no interaction between the particles. Fine. And that gave you the ideal gas law, which works very, very well. Well, now what we'd like to do is extend that idea, extend that simple picture by including interactions between the molecules. And once we include interactions, then it's no longer an ideal gas, it's a realistic gas. And so argon is a very good example. The reason we choose argon for, for this model is that argon is an inert gas. Now, if you recall what that means, there's a closed shell of electrons, and there's always extra stability in chemistry associated with a closed shell. And consequently, it's hard to move the internal structure of argon. So to a good first approximation, argon molecules, which are just single atoms, act like hard spheres. So we will do a simulation in which we have lots of hard spheres put into a box, but the spheres interact with each other, not just bouncing off each other like billiard balls, but actually have some potential interaction. So they're hard spheres, but they still can feel each other around. So let's move on. How do we do this? Well, we do it in the sort of obvious way. And here on the left, just to show you the kind of stuff that goes on, we have a figure made by a student in the class. Even when he wasn't supposed to be making this figure, he couldn't resist trying out the model, saying, what happens if I shoot a bullet or shoot an atom into a whole lattice full of atoms? So here on the bottom, you have an atom coming up, hitting, about to hit this whole array. Here we have the atom moving in the array, and part of the array has disappeared here for no apparent reason. And you can see it's left a little hole, but you can also see it's shot some particles out to the side. And now we have over here the particle, the projectile is left, and it's left behind this clump of interacting molecules. Now this is very similar to what in nuclear physics would be called a compound nucleus formation, where you shoot a projectile, like a slow neutron, like they do in nuclear reactors, into a nucleus. And then that causes all the particles to interact with each other and just blow, blow themselves apart very slowly, but really emit other particles. And as you see here, even if the projectile leaves, you have these particles interacting with each other and pushing themselves apart as they still interact. So this is the kind of stuff we want to do. 
So molecular dynamics can simulate physical systems, properties of physical systems, chemical properties. It can be used for solids, liquids, gases, even amorphous materials like glasses, and biological materials. And in fact, I'll show you an example on some slide coming of a biological application which has won the Nobel Prize. So what is, M what is MD as we call it, molecular dynamics? Well, it's just F equals MA. It's just Newton's laws, classical physics, applied to the individual molecules in a substance. It's as simple as that. F equals MA is the whole thing. And of course, the F comes from some potential. Okay? And then M, the rest is just dynamic. So it's very easy. And you can ask yourself, gee, if you're doing atoms and you're doing molecules binding to each other and bouncing off each other, shouldn't we be using quantum mechanics? After all, quantum mechanics is the correct theory for understanding physics at the atomic level. And so the answer to that question is, of course, you should always use quantum mechanics. It helps all the physicists make a living. But it's very hard to use quantum mechanics for some things. And for this case, this problem, we don't need very much quantum mechanics. Okay? So when we're talking about the bulk properties, in other words, the you know, pressure, temperature, dependence of material, the density, we're not talking about the small r behavior of the atoms. We're talking how they interact at large scales. And at small scales, we need quantum mechanics. To derive the potential, we need quantum mechanics. But for the large r behavior, the large distance behavior, the bulk properties, we can get away with not using quantum mechanics. How do we know this? Because we did it and we got away with it. Simple as that, and it works. Okay? So uh, as you'll see if you take more advanced classes, in quantum mechanics, particularly DFT, density functional theory, we can actually derive what the effective potential is between two molecules, two atoms. Okay? So not just you know, model it, but actually derive it from first principles. But we're not going to do that here. We're going to have just fun. So what is molecular dynamics? Well, molecular dynamics is what some people call the high school physics problem from hell. What does that mean? It means that it's simple enough for a high school student to understand. It's just F equals MA. But it involves many, many particles, so many that you'd go crazy keeping track of them all. Now, you know, realistic substances would have an Avogadro's type number of particles, 10 to 23rd, say 10 to 25th. No one in their right mind can simulate that yet. No computer can do that. But we can simulate large numbers, say a million particles for proteins, or maybe 100 million particles for materials. And these numbers keep increasing by orders of magnitude. But they're still you know, not there for uh, uh, it's for a realistic substance. So let's go ahead and look. What can we do? <clears throat> well, here, let's look at the picture first. So let's look at the next slide, slide 17. Take a look at that picture. Tell me if you can figure out what it is. Well, this is a, this is a biological application of molecular dynamics. And what you see here is you see a clump of protein that is a model of the cell wall in you and I. It's called an aquaprotein, aqua aqua aquaporin, take it back. It's called an aquaporin for the protein. And you, we have water molecules which can permeate the cell walls. And here is a channel. And the question is, basic question in biology, is how can water molecules permeate the cell walls through these proteins, but not other molecules? How can they be kept out? And the answer was not known until this protein was simulated on a computer and with molecular dynamics. And the process was watched, and they could see a little over here in this area, as you'll see later on, maybe more clearly, there's a turnstile-like mechanism which if you have a polar molecule like water, and these are the red guys here, uh, red and white guys, flips it around, the Hearn style. And some of them are colored, I think, yellow, just so you can see them move a little more clearly. But the ordinary round molecules can't flip the Hearn style. So here's the movie of that. OK, so boom. So Aggie won the Nobel Prize 
for this simulation in 1993, and this was the first time a computer animation was mentioned by the Nobel Committee uh, as part of the award. Here you can see the turnstile, and here this yellow, yellow molecule is just there to uh, make it easier to see, but you can see it can flip its way around this turnstile-like mechanism where an ordinary round molecule couldn't. And you see here everything we want. The structure here, the molecular structure, comes about just by putting in the crystal structure and then using molecular dynamics to calculate the solids. Okay? And the, uh, so, you know, so that also comes from molecular dynamics. The, the gas here or the water in suspension, the liquid, is just molecular dynamics. So these each are feeling the force of all the other atoms and just bouncing off each other because of the force is acting. And it's realistic forces. And then there are forces within the substance here which cause the whole thing to go. So it's not just a, uh, a model. It's actually a simulation. Okay, so let's stop this and get back to work. Ah, too bad. Worked. OK, so we have two powerful techniques uh, we are, we, under our belts now, or we will have two soon. We've already studied Monte Carlo techniques, which I'll abbreviate as MC. And that's very good. We use that to simulate thermodynamics. We now will also study molecular dynamics. And in addition to the MD and MC sort of being close together in the alphabet, they're actually similar in a number of ways, enough so that people get confused. And they're both used often. Sometimes they're even intermixed. So what do we have? Both techniques can handle very large number of particles. They can use smaller number of particles as well. But if you're trying to calculate thermodynamic, which is a statistical uh, characteristics of matter, then we need to have large number of particles. And they both can do that. And they're similar in the algorithmic sense because both can start, and often do, with arbitrary initial configurations. And then they let the systems equilibrate. They let them interact. And it gets to a final state in which the particles have thermodynamic equilibrium of some sort. Whereas in thermodynamic simulations with Monte Carlo, we said the final results, if you recall, with the Metropolis algorithm agreed with how, with, the, with thermodynamics, the approach to equilibrium was not being described by a Metropolis algorithm, because that's only proper for systems in equilibrium. Here, in contrast, in MD, we have first principles almost calculation so that the approach to equilibrium can be described, is described, by these equations. So the simulation is much more dynamical. It's much more interesting. In sort of an accounting sense, molecular dynamics is what we'd call the micro-canonical ensemble. Micro-canonical meaning here that the energy is going to be fixed, the total energy of the system, the volume of the system, and the number of particles is fixed. If you recall when we did Metropolis algorithm and heat uh, simulations for the icing model, Monte Carlo technique, we used a canonical ensemble. We had a heat bath, which kept the system at a constant temperature, and we had a fixed number of particles as well. But the temperature never changed. The average kinetic energy was built, built in. Okay? MD, molecular dynamics, has dynamics built in. That's why it's called dynamics, MD. Okay? It's just F equals MA. It's just Newton laws. But it's, it's right. Generally, Monte Carlo has no dynamics. We replace the dy dynamics in Monte Carlo by just using random numbers. Now, one can view random numbers, particularly used in Monte Carlo techniques, as saying it's a system for which there are so many degrees of freedom that it's hard to keep track of any one or two. The answers just seem random. And that's a good approximation. Here we're saying, no, we have, we're going to follow what's going on. And how we follow what's going on in molecular dynamics is we look at various time steps, just like integrating uh, differential equations as we've done before. We have time step, step ahead, and move ahead, step by step. And we keep track of every particle's position and velocity and watch them change continuously. It's a lot of bookkeeping, especially if you have a million particles. But you just move them ahead step by step. And after you're done, or at any point you want, you can calculate the thermodynamic variables. So that's what overview. That's what we're going to do in molecular dynamics. Now let's talk about how we actually do it. Look at slide number 24. You see, we're on 24. We're nearly done. <coughs> so on the, on the title here of this slide, 
it says, let's apply Newton's law, and the energy determines visibility. So this is always something which used to bother me as a student, which is if I'm going to smash things together. For example, here I have a simple model of two argon atoms. Each of them has 18 electrons and a nucleus with a positive charge of plus 18. Okay? And that nucleus is composed of neutrons and protons. And here, this argon atom is interacting with another argon atom, which also has 18 electrons and also has a nucleus of 18 nucleons, neutrons and protons. Well, what always bothered me is, how do you know which interactions are important? when you say two particles are interacting? Well, it's the energy of the system. If, you, if your system does not have enough energy to excite, say, the nucleus, the nucleus is inert. It's like a point particle. It doesn't interact at all. Okay? So if you're dealing with atomic-type interactions of, say, you know, half an electron volt, you know, something like that, a thermal process, then you don't have enough energy to interact with the nucleus. You can forget about the nucleus. Likewise, if these particles don't have enough energy to excite these energy, these electrons from their particular energy levels, you know, if it just you make you squeeze them but don't really excite them, then the internal degrees of freedom of the atoms don't matter either. So the answer is, how do you know what you'll see when you probe a system with a particle? Depends on how much energy. If you have very little energy, you'll see just bulk properties of the system. If you have more energy, you begin to see the atom. If you have yet more energy, you begin to see the inner parts of the atom. If you have still more energy, millions of electron volts, you begin to see effects and then see uh, the consequences of there being a nucleus present. And if you have even you know, a thousand times more energy, you begin to see the particles within the nucleus or the particles within the neutrons and protons as you keep going up and up. So here we're talking about low energies. Okay. So even at low energies, though, we should be doing a first principle calculation, because that's what physicists like to do, start with the most basic simple laws, and then derive properties from that. So we should be talking about the 18 electrons in one atom interacting with the 18 electrons in the other atom by the Coulomb force, you know, by this you know, one, over, 1 over R force, and then you know, E for one charge and E for the other. That's first principles. But we, you know, but also we should have, oh, we have the, each electron here would also interact with the nucleus, and likewise each electron here would also interact with the nucleus. So in reality we have thousands of electron-electron interactions, Coulomb force, and we have thousands of electron-nucleus interactions, which we should include even just from the Coulomb interaction. There's, of course, if the energy gets high enough, the two nuclei can begin to interact with a strong or nuclear force, but forgetting about that, we don't have that energy. But even for the energies considered, we should be talking about a thousand interactions, or thousands of interactions. Well, we're going to ignore, essentially, all the internal interactions, all the inter internal rearrangements of the electrons, and say, we'll deal instead with the phenomenological potential. We'll deal with some potential which just talks about how these two atoms as a whole interact with each other. That's a simplification. There's no reason to think it should work all the time, but for argon, which is a inert gas and other inert gases, it probably is not too bad. If you have you know, some uh, single electron atom outside a shell, then that's not going to be a good approximation. Okay? So we'll assume that the potential is conservative. And that means two things. It means, first of all, it conserves energy. So the total energy of the system is constant. There's no friction. There's no radiation. And also, we'll assume that the interactions are central, are central, which means that it's just a function of the distance between the two particles here, and that we can take the derivative of the potential to get a force. So it means, you know, our usual friends. We also assume that the interaction depends on Rij, which is the distance from particle I to particle J. You may say, of course, what else is this? But what we're assuming is that even if you have here a box full of atoms present, the total interaction that any one particle feels is just due to the sum 
of the individual interactions with each of the other particles. The fact that there's three particles in one neighborhood doesn't change the force that any two feel at one time. There are physical examples in which the third particle will change that force. The Efimov effect is, is one such example. But they're small and rare and hardly ever seen, so this seems to be a good approximation. Okay? We'll come back to that in a moment. So, equation one tells us that we're applying Newton's law. Here's force, this is mass, and this is acceleration. So every particle inside of this box has the same mass, m, particle i, and i runs over 1 to capital N, the total number of particles, has an acceleration which is just given by the force on that particle. But it's not a simple force. That force will depend on the position and possibly the velocity of every other particle in the box. So it's a complicated function. But for what we've said here, it's a central force between the particles. So the f and conservative forces, so the force will be just the derivative of some potential, and the potential can depend on all the other particles' positions, and the particle you're talking of. But what makes it very simple is now the force is a two-body force. So we just sum over the interaction, and it's the same because all of these argon atoms are identical. It's the same between every two argon atoms. So we just sum over the potential between any two argon atoms. So that's U right there. You know, so U is just the interaction between these two particles. And then, you know, there's another U for that one, another U here, another U there. We just sum over all of them, which is this sum. And if you notice the sum, this particle I we're solving for is always less than particle J, which starts off at zero and goes up to n minus one. But this less than means that we never have a particle interacting with itself. Okay. And that's important. So, you know, and the minus sign comes about because the force is minus the potential. So, that's all, we, you know, that's Newton's laws. That's all the dynamics we really have to put in. It's just F equals MA. The question is, what potential do we use? So, look at the next slide, and you'll see our potential. <clears throat> so, this next slide starts off by showing you a picture of what's known as the Leonard Jones potential. And I can't emphasize this strong enough, so I'll write it down here again. This is not the potential between two electrons. This is the potential between atom to atom. Okay? So in between, for each atom, A-T-O-M, something like that, each atom has a force. It should be a, a really a many-body force, and what we're saying here is no. The force bet between any two atoms is a constant. I'm sorry, the force between any two atoms is the simple function of just one variable, the distance between them. And it's not the sum of many Coulomb potentials, but it effectively is the sum of many, many Coulomb potentials. And it's given by this mathematical function here. Okay? So this is the, the potential between the two particles, and the force is just the derivative of that given below. So what you see in the potential is it has two terms. It has 1 over r to the 12th, and a 1 over r to the 6th. It has some constant out in front, epsilon, which is the strength. This type of potential is known as a phenomenological potential. I'll say that again. Try it if you can't say it yet. Phenomenological, or sometimes it might be called an empirical potential. It's modeled on the physics we think is true, but it's really just thought up in somebody's head, I think probably Leonard and Jones, and they just changed the parameters, adjusted the parameters until they agreed with experimental data very well using calculations such as this. So epsilon is the strength, the overall strength right there. Sigma is a length scale. So sigma sets the length scale that occurs here. So there's sigma over r, sigma over r. So sigma is, of course, a length itself. And I give you the numbers in the text. And it, it's, it's not very important. What is important is that we see here this potential, and the potential is given in red, is the sum of two terms. It's the sum of a short-range term in blue, which is very repulsive. How do I know it's short-range? Because it falls off at large r more quickly than the potential itself, and it's the sum of another term, a long-range term, which in this case, that falls off like r to the 6, which is still falls off quickly which is an attractive potential. 
So, you know, the sign, this is a positive sign, that's the short range repulsion. This negative sign is the long range attraction. Okay, and the force has just the opposite uh, sign, but that's, that's fine. <clears throat> so what we see here is a potential which mimics two physical effects. Mimics, it's not, it's not exact. What happens when we try to put together two atoms full of electrons and we push them close together is the electron clouds overlap with each other. Well, electron clouds don't like to do that for two reasons. One, the Pauli principle tells us that no two electrons can occupy the same quantum states, so you can't put them in the same place in space. And if they have other quantum numbers the same, so they repel each other, it's just statistically. And second of all, they do repel each other physically as well because of the Coulomb force. Okay. So there's one over R to the 12th here, mimics the effect of many, many electrons repelling each other, Coulomb force, and the Pauli effect. That's easy. What about this attractive R to the 6th term? How can a bunch of electrons attract each other? How can, how can one atom attract another atom? Well, usually they can if they're polar, if they have you know, one's positive and one's negative, you know, like CO2 or H2O or whatever, you can have uh, ions attract each other. But here we're saying inert gas molecules, uncharged, attract each other. How can that come about? Well, it just barely comes about, is what this says. It doesn't attract each other like 1 over r squared, like a Coulomb potential, but rather, r squared here would be the force, 1 over r for the Coulomb potential. It attracts like 1 over r to the sixth. And that's a dipole-dipole interaction. And what that's telling us is at large r, there's a very weak van der Waals attraction between the two atoms. So this is a model of the van der Waals attraction, and it's a dipole-dipole interaction. So imagine having two clouds of electrons. And you know what a dipole is. You know, a dipole moment is if we have a positive charge here and we have a negative charge there, we'd say there's a dipole moment like that. Okay. Well, let's say we have one dipole here at one instant of time, you know, electron in one atom on the left, this is the left, this is an atom on the right, two different atoms, you know, has a dipole moment there. That's positive, this is minus. Well, if it's like that, the negative part of the dipole moment will attract a, or repel an electron from the atom on the right and force its electron over here and ha make that atom on the right more positive. So this is one atom, this is another atom. What you're having here is if you instantaneously get a dipole moment in one, it stimulates, it induces a dipole moment in the other. But two dipole moments lined up head to tail attract each other. So we get here this very weak attraction, and it comes from this fluctuating dipole moment. This, this electron, this could be in one instant, the electron moves around here, the moments just flip around. Okay? It's not a big effect, it's a small effect, but it's what holds a lot of things like argon, solid, and liquids together. So let's go ahead and use it. How do we put this into a simulation? Take, let's take a little break now, because now we have to get down to work and actually compute something based on these simple ideas.